can't see you unless I take my glasses off. <laughs> um, thank you for, for coming. My name is Michael Byers, and I am the chair of the board of the Salt Spring Forum. Um, this is a, a special evening for the Salt Spring Forum uh, because of a man named Andy Scoos. Many of you will have known Andy. Um, Andy uh, was a geophysicist who uh, worked in the oil industry for most of his career. Um, and a decade ago, he and his wife, Anique, who is here tonight, uh, moved to, to Salt Spring Island. Um, and Andy changed from being an oil company executive, he was the VP of Incana, to being a very committed and effective climate change activist using his expertise from the oil industry to essentially counter the legions of deniers and skeptics who are out there, especially on the internet. Andy came to me eight or nine months ago and said, we have an amazing opportunity. We have the world's best person on the cognitive science of climate denial coming to Vancouver for a conference. His name is Stephen Lewandowski, and I know him, and I think I can get him to the Salt Spring Forum. So I said, absolutely. <laughs> Please, let's bring him to the Salt Spring Forum. And, and so we set it up, and uh, Professor Lewandowski agreed to come, and um, we set the date, and Andy was going to moderate. Um, now, a Andy lived a an amazing life, and, and I think that, that we should celebrate his life rather than, than mourn his passing um, two months ago. And, and we're celebrating his life by continuing with this event and making sure it's the best darn event it could possibly be. And he was not into ceremony, that's it um, from me uh, about him, uh, but I want you to, to know that. Um, so yeah, Stephen Lewandowski, um, cognitive scientist from the University of Bristol, before that the University of Western Australia, has a PhD from the University of Toronto. Um, he's an absolutely massive figure in this field, um, and, and he will answer questions about climate change denial, and how your brain works, and how it sometimes doesn't work. <laughs> and, and I hope it'll be a, an absolutely amazing conversation, and, and who knows, someone like want to ask about smart meters or contrails. Um, and, and, and then to, to, to moderate uh, uh, Stephen Lewandowski and to moderate all of you, um, we decided to call upon a figure in this community who, who most of you know, um, who happens to have a degree in psychology and a few decades of experience managing eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds in elementary schools. Um, I'm speaking about Catherine Byers, of course. Uh, so behave yourself uh, this evening. Um, uh, she is also a, a very committed environmentalist um, with a degree in environmental education from Oxford. Um, it's going to be an amazing conversation, so please join me in welcoming uh, Stephen Lewandowski and Catherine Byers. ago and he learned that I was coming to Vancouver. He said, you know, come over and visit and do this. And I said, yeah, of course. And until quite recently, actually, he was very optimistic that, that he might be here tonight to moderate. But uh, unfortunately, that wasn't to happen. Um, now, I've known Andy for five, six years. We've 
met several times in person at conferences, which these days is actually very unusual that you know someone face to face, because most of the people I know mm -hmm. are uh, uh, internet colleagues, and we spend most of our time corresponding by email. But no, I knew Andy in person, he was a wonderful man, and made an incredible contribution to the skeptical science community, which is one of the world's leading blogs about climate science, and contributed to um, uh, quite a number of peer reviewed articles, and I had the privilege of publishing, I think, one or two papers with Andy, so he's uh, sorely missed and a great loss to the climate community. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Right, well, to start this evening, a couple of questions for you first before we, we turn over to the audience here this evening. Um, we talk about climate skeptics and climate deniers. And so just sort of start thinking about the language that we use around people with, with, who, who are are not sort of as engaged with, with, with the state of the climate and, and where we should be moving. Are climate skeptics climate deniers? Are, are they one and the same? I mean, what is your understanding, your research actually sort of informed, can inform us about some of the language we use? Yeah, well, these Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, there's a big difference between skepticism and denial. And the people who call themselves skeptics by and large aren't skeptical, but they're instead engaging in what I call denial. Now, now let me just make, make one brief comment about the terminology here. Um, I'm not terribly happy to call people skeptics or deniers or warmists or racists or whatever it is, because that's categorizing people, putting them in a box, with the label on there, and then that sort of becomes fixed and static. So I prefer to talk about people who are denying climate change. Because when I talk about people who are denying climate change, then I'm talking about their behavior. And I'm leaving open the possibility that they might stop doing that tomorrow. And that is something we should always keep in mind. So if I slip into the shorthand of saying denier or denialist this evening, then let me you know, prefix that as an apology, because really I should be talking about people who deny. Now, how do I know that people who deny climate change are not being skeptical? Well, first of all, science by definition and in operation is skeptical. So it is actually climate scientists who are climate skeptics because they're constantly uh, questioning what their own findings are showing them. And what the um, people who deny climate change do is nothing like that. Quite on the contrary, uh, what it is is a political operation that is masquerading as a scientific debate. Now, how do I know that? Well, um, a number of ways. I've written a few papers recently where I analyzed the behavior, the techniques by which people deny climate change. And so, for example, I published an article not too long ago where what I did was to take the public statements that uh, climate deniers, I now have to use the shorthand, <laughs> uh, deny, what, what climate deniers say in public, I took these statements, I combined them with the actual data that they were commenting on, and I showed both the statements and the data to independent experts, economists and statisticians, and asked them whether these statements were accurate. Now here's the twist. Importantly, what I did in that study was to translate both the data and the claims from climate change into economic language. It's still the same data, but I said it's world agricultural output rather than temperatures going up. And I translated everything into this, you know, less politically toxic and highly charged environment so that I could conduct a blind test. The experts didn't know what they were judging. They just saw these claims and they saw the data and I asked them to tell me whether they're accurate or misleading. And guess what? It turns out that across a number of indicator variables, a large number of claims that uh, deniers are making in public, the experts almost universally said, no, that's misleading, it's false, it is not representing the data, it is inadequate for policy advice. Or, and, and so on, on that basis, you know, I'm pretty convinced that what's happening here is not that deniers have a different perspective on the data, but that they are engaging in a political activity that is effectively denying the public the right to be informed. 
But that is the thing that concerns me about climate denial, that when you make these mendacious claims and they're being picked up by the media and infuse the public discussion, really what you're doing is to deny everybody in this room the right to be informed. Right. So just to open up the conversation a little bit around the link to conspiracy theories and some of the research you've done there um, around climate deniers and, and how they sort of pair up with, with being um, conspiracy in, in relation to conspiracy theories. Um, you think about uh, vaccinations mm -hmm. and genetic modified <coughs> food, sometimes anecdotally um, described as the, um, sort of the conspiracies of the left. Yeah. And I know you've done a little bit more research around around that. Could you expand sure. a little bit more about sure. that relationship between conspiracy theories? Absolutely. Well, let me let me first talk about the conspiracy <coughs> theories and then talk about the politics yeah. involved in the science denial because they're kind of slightly separate issues. First of all, talk about conspiracy theories. The problem is this, if all the scientists, nearly all the scientists agree on a scientific proposition, and you're trying to deny that, what are you gonna do? I mean, it's a hard thing to say, well, you know, I know better than 97% of scientists who've researched this thing for their entire career, excuse me, their <coughs> entire career. So the only way out of that dilemma is to say, well, all these scientists are in cahoots. They're colluding to create this hoax in order to create the world government or whatever it is, right? And that is why the language of conspiracy theorizing is very close to the surface of climate denial, uh, wherever you look. I mean, Trump has tweeted about climate change being a hoax invented by the Chinese. And if you look at all the, or God knows what reason, um, and if you look at all the environmentally skeptical books about climate change, it's all about hoax, it's about the world government, it's, it's all these sort of paranoid, uh, this fear of scientists cooking up this, this hoax. And I think that's an inevitable consequence of there being a scientific agreement. And so we find that with vaccinations, we find it with uh, HIV AIDS, we find it wherever we look, if people are refusing to accept well-established science, sooner or later they'll resort to a conspiracy theory, and they'll say the scientists are polluting. So I think it's a necessary ingredient of denial, and wherever you look, um, you find that. But now we turn to the politics mm -hmm. that you mentioned, which is very interesting. Um, now, I have data and multiple experiments and other people have shown in multiple studies that there's an extremely strong association between endorsing free market economics and rejecting climate science. I can ask people four questions about the free market. And those people who turn out to be very much in favor of unregulated free market and free enterprise economics, I can be almost certain that they will deny the laws of physics. Why? Well, because if climate change is real and we want to do something about it, we're going to have to change the way we do business. One way or another, either through tax, price on carbon, or worst of all, regulations. You know, imagine that. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very easy to see there that um, people on the political right might be very challenged by climate change. And now, what happened when this first became known, this is, you know, we've known this for about 10 years at least, and more than that. What then happened, I think, was that the media in North America were desperately trying to be balanced, and understandably so. So they looked around, they scanned the horizon, and they looked only to the left over there and thought, God, you know, there's got to be some denial on the left, and, you know, ah, there's one person on the left, and he or she doesn't like vaccinations. Ah, yeah, right. Therefore, vaccinations, vaccine hesitancy was the climate denial of the left. And then they kept looking and they, ah, there was somebody over there on the left denying that genetically modified foods are safe. Therefore, GMO opposition is a left wing thing. Now, that was fascinating for me because, you know, the media kind of came to the strong conclusion about science denial on the left based entirely on anecdotes. Just identifying one or two people who were on the left and then saying it's a left-wing thing. Is it? Well, no. 
turns out that by now we have four, five, six studies with large surveys, you know, a thousand Americans. In, in my case, I've done this twice, a thousand people each time. We now have four or five studies showing that um, either there's no association between politics and attitudes towards GMOs, or if there's anything, it is that people on the political right are distrusting the scientists more. And the same with vaccination. It's exactly the same with vaccination. Study after study shows that if there's anything, then there's people on the political right who object to vaccinations. And it's not entirely surprising either because libertarians don't like the government to interfere with their uh, children, even if it's to keep them alive. You know, the, the threat of interference is, is uh, for them a real concern. So, yeah, so um, until now, until today, I've been working on this for five years off and on, and I have yet to find the scientific proposition that is rejected more on the political left than the political right. It didn't take long for you to mention Trump, I must say, but um, I'm, we'll probably come up again this evening, but I, yeah, I know ideology is, is, is also being part of, part of your research and how that plays into, in, into climate denial. So I do want to open up to questions from, from the audience, and the way it works, we'll perhaps start at one, one side and we'll work our way across. On the right. Do you we'll want start to on the right, on the right <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pray. Yes, all right. Uh, Fraser has the microphone, so let's start with questions from this side of the audience. Anybody got a question they would like to ask Stephen? Yes. I'll start right off with, with one that uh, maybe goes to the end of the piece, which is, does your research show anything that what does it take for to make people change their mind? What will actually, what? What circumstances? My father used to say, a student of history, that people wouldn't change anything they'd like to do until it hit them right in the face. Was he right? Well, yes and no, I think. Um, it's a very good question, and really, the, the, you know, <laughs> everything I do is gearing up to being able to answer that question. Um, let's first start out with a little bit of history, more, you know, very recent history, um, where we've had, you know, a significant change in opinion. And what I'm thinking of is gay marriage, which 20, 30 years ago was a fantasy for the people who wanted it and a non-issue for everybody else. And I think now in most countries uh, in the West, after 20 or 30 years, there's been a dramatic shift in attitudes and depending on where you look and what country you're talking about, it's now either legal or getting close to legal or it's completely accepted. So, so attitudes can change. That's the point I'm making with that example. They can change dramatically, they can change in a relatively short period of time. So, how do we do, how do we change people's attitudes about climate change? Well, um, there's a large number of things we've attempted and quite a few things we've found to work. Uh, the one issue that I work with is to tell people about the scientific consensus. In other words, what I do in my experiments sometimes is to say to people, hey, look, did you know that 97 out of 100 climate scientists agree on the basis of their analysis of the evidence that human beings are changing the climate? And it turns out that by just giving people that number, which is far higher than what people normally think, um, that that is shifting their opinions, attitudes slightly and makes them slightly more supportive of policy. So that's just one simple way in which we can uh, shift people. Then there are other ways. We can uh, reframe climate change as a national security threat. So with conservatives, if that's done by a messenger who is acceptable to them, usually a guy in a uniform with lots of gold stars up here, then, you know, they say, oh, national security. Yes, sir. I've got to do something about it. Uh, and, and, and the Pentagon, of course, is totally committed to, to, you know, I mean, they, they, there's no disagreement in the Pentagon about the science of climate change because they consider that to be one of the biggest national security risks for the uh, future. So, another way to reframe it is to talk about the health co benefits of dealing with climate change. And one of the things that, that we know from history is that 
if you reduce pollution, people live longer, right? And, you know, even Republicans like to live longer. So if you, if you tell them that this is a health issue and that you can have a healthier life by going to renewable energies, then there is some evidence to suggest that that is, again, shifting people's attitudes. And then the list goes on. I mean, we have all these sort of nice little tools that we can apply in a, in a public uh, debate, and we can show how people shift their attitudes. However, we can go even further than that. And one of the things that I think is, is important is to realize that, you know, to some extent, we don't even have to change people's attitudes. So long as somebody is putting up a solar panel and buying an electric car, I actually don't care what they think about climate change. And so long as we have the politics in place to do something about climate change, I also don't care how people feel about it. And that is, I think, important not to lose sight of that, that we don't have to convince everybody of climate change. We just got to have the right politics. And that brings us to Trump. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Uh, that was a great summary, thank you. And what about issues? How long do you think uh, it does take? You, you mentioned, say, gay marriage, and in my lifetime, there's, what, DDT, uh, smoking, uh, drinking, driving, I don't know, the list goes on and on if I think back. And it does seem to be, you know, it starts up slow, uh, you reach a tipping point, tipping point, and then boom, we're there. And it's, Seems to me it's always a two to three decade issue, possibly. Lead and gasoline. My father worked selling lead and gasoline. And until the tooth fairy project in the UK where you had children mail the teeth in, and then it became irrefutable that lead mm -hmm. was correlated with uh, cognitive abilities. Um, but it took, you know, what, 20 years or more? But there seems to be a, it's not a five year click. And yet, it's not 100 years. And it sort of makes me wonder when they were thinking that the world was flat around. I wonder how long that took. <laughs> well, I think you're right. I, I, would, I would share that view that we're talking about 20 or 30 years to have a dramatic shift in, in public opinion. Um, however, that is stretchable. Um, and I think what is stretching it maybe into more than just 20 or 30 years is the organized opposition to it. Um, and the one precedent that I'm thinking of here is tobacco control. We've known that tobacco causes lung cancer since before World War II. You know, the evidence was pretty strong then. And it became completely unequivocal, uh, maybe by 1950, or thereabouts. And yet it took another, gosh, 20, yeah, 20, 30 years before, 40 years maybe, before we were able to do something about this because of organized opposition <coughs> of the tobacco industry. Um, and I fear that with climate change, we have precisely that situation. In fact, if you want to understand climate change, all you've got to understand is tobacco. It's about the same situation. It's the same politics. Not only is it the same politics, it's the same guys. It's the same people, and it's guys, it's, it's not women, it's by and large old white males who, uh, you know, 40 years ago said tobacco is good for you, and now they're telling you that it's a good for you. And that's the problem that may slow us down. Right, moving across. Yes, Jeff. Yeah. Um, so could you please maybe draw some parallels or some contrasts with uh, evolutionary biology and creationism and so-called creation science, where there's clearly a religious component here, but there's also some um, comparisons. Yeah, absolutely. I think, well, as you already said, there are some striking parallels there. And, uh, for example, the National Center for Science Education in the United States is addressing both evolution and climate change as their two primary uh, battlefields, so to speak. Um, and I think what's happening in, in, in evolutionary biology is, is exactly the same thing. It is ideologically and that religiously slash ideologically motivated opposition to uh, science. 
And um, the people who oppose that are strongly motivated because it is, it is touching their deepest feelings about how the world should operate. And if you're a you know, strong believer in a certain interpretation of the Bible, then, then evolution to you is, is emotionally just, just wild, wow, incredibly challenging. And I think that's what we're also observing with climate change. And, and we mustn't underestimate the um, depth of uh, people's emotions and uh, uh, feelings about this issue, which explains why it can be so toxic so quickly. Because you're really hitting the person's core when you talk about climate change or evolution. Sometimes when you, you know, some of your studies, when you've taken climate change off the graph, if you like, and you put in some uh, another, or some other, other, other x y axis or later, yeah. you then find that that, that isn't the, the the emotions taken out and yeah. the results are the same. Or uh, well, no, in my blind expert test, mm -hmm. well, um, well, it's certainly the case that if you relabel the axes and you take out climate change, that mm -hmm. then um, it is so abundantly clear mm -hmm. that the denialist statements are just misleading. That, that pretty much everybody can just spot that straight away. Um, now, I ran another study a couple of, well, a number of years ago, ago now, where what I did was I, I walked up to people in Perth, Western Australia, which is where I was living at the time, and showed them the graph with the temperature. And I then asked them to tell me where that was going. Right? And they gave them a pencil, and here was the graph, and they sort of went, oh, okay, goes up. Of course it does. You know, I mean, where else is it going to go? Uh, just looking at the graph. And I did that again in two different lines. In one case, I said, this is global warming data. In the other case, um, I said, well, that's a sheer price of the XYZ Witch Corporation. <laughs> now, what's interesting is that um, in both cases, people went up, as the data suggested. But only in the global warming case was the steepness of that so-called extrapolation determined by people's attitudes about climate change. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there what happened was quite interesting that the more skeptical, quote unquote, people were of climate change, the, the, the lower they thought temperature was gonna go in the future. However, however, even those people who totally rejected the idea that there was climate change, when you asked them to predict what was gonna happen in the future, they still went up. Not as much as anybody else, but they still went up. And that's because if you show people the data, it is actually extremely powerful. And which is one of the reasons why climate deniers work so hard to undermine the data and to accuse NASA of, of adjusting temperatures and you know all that kind of stuff. Because anybody who sees the graph just knows we have a problem. You know, flat temperatures for a thousand years and now they go up. Uh, I guess well, dealing with climate change, we just we have to deal with a, a multifaceted approach to climate change. It can't just be oh, we shut down the coal plants and everything will be fine. And uh, I've read several times and heard several times that the main culprit to climate change and, and actually getting a, a handle on it is capitalism itself. That capitalism and, and, and climate change are not compatible. And so the whole, the whole thing about us trying to consume ourselves into a greener society and a greener, you know, it's all about buying cars, new cars and, and everything else that goes along with it. How do we change? How, is there any research happening? And how do we change this, this whole thing that we all do is consume? And we'll consume ourselves into a bleak world. Yeah, I think, well, that's obviously Naomi Klein's point, I would say, you know, she's, she's made that point that yeah. this changes everything. And capitalism is, is uh, we have to change capitalism in order to, to deal with climate change. Well, gosh, that's a big question. I, I don't have, you know, I don't have a clear answer to that because it's, you know, slightly difficult to, 
to answer because to run the experiment, you'd have to get rid of capitalism first and then see if it makes a difference. <laughs> and, and that's kind of hard to do for me as a you know, uh, laboratory researcher. So, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm in two minds about that. I actually, on the basis of how quickly things are moving along in terms of technology and uh, price reductions and all that, I'm, I'm actually reasonably optimistic that we don't have to get rid of capitalism just yet. Uh, well, unless you want to for other reasons, that's you know, another conversation about that. But if you look at the immense drop in price in solar panels at the pace of technology when it comes to electric cars and how quickly you know battery technology is advancing and how the prices of batteries are falling and how you know um, it is very interesting to go back in time for the last 10 years or so and look at the annual predictions of the IEA, the International Energy Agency, and what they had to say was going to happen to alternative energies, to clean energy, and solar penetration, all that kind of stuff. <coughs> well, it's, it's wonderful because you know every year they had to draw a new graph that made the you know, clean energies go up much faster than they had thought. But they've been doing this for 10 years. You know, the, the developments are outpacing the projections in a very positive way in many circumstances. Now, I'm not saying that solved the problem just yet. But what I am saying is that there's, there, there, there's radical change underlying. And we do know from research, psychological research, cognitive research, that people are always underestimating the consequences of exponential growth. People don't understand exponential growth by and large. And that's often a bad thing. However, in this case, I think it's a good thing because people are completely underestimating the pace of uh, acceptance of electric cars, solar panels, and so on. And so, depending on how you look at it, I'm actually willing to give capitalism another chance for the foreseeable future. Uh, I think it will, will do quite quite a few amazing things. <clears throat> Where do you see capital change in capitalism? I'll just take actually I'll just take Brian in front of Jim first of all and then we'll move down. Thank you very much for attending this evening. My question actually I would like to have the expertise of both of you, given your both of your, uh, academic specialties. I, I happen to be a particular fan of uh, Richard Dawkins and his immense research on evolutionary biology, but especially I'm a fan, because of my own abrasive personality, of his critique of, uh, of creation, science, and all that stuff. And he's he has been, although he's getting older now and somewhat retired, but he has been very, very active, very forthright, and traveled throughout the southern states and, and Australia and, and challenging these views and stuff, and he's been unremitting, and there's YouTube things. My question to both of you is, is that up from in your face, uh, very erudite manner of challenging these beliefs, do you think it's effective? I like Think it is. I like your professional, either your professional opinions on that. <laughs> Have a hot potato. Yeah. No, uh, I think. Well, in all of this, the, the the answer to pretty much any question about how to communicate with people is it depends. It depends on who you're talking to. It depends on who you are. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. Now, um, the Dawkins style is, I, I love it. I mean, I love reading his rants. You know, oh, they make me feel good. You know, here's another guy who, who is, you know, really outspoken and rational, I think, and, you know, evidence-driven and, and, and has the same values that I have. Um, I also think that he is very effective in preaching to the choir. That is, people who are already committed to science. Um, and that is a very important thing to do. I don't think we should underestimate how important it is 
uh, to preach to the choir, because otherwise the choir might not be there. Anymore. I think we really have to reach out to people who are like us and, and reiterate how important this issue is. So I think there Dawkins is probably uh, very effective. Now, I can imagine that in other situations, this sort of, you know, uh, door in the face kind of approach might not be that successful and that people will be turned off by, you know, that he's often called arrogant, out of touch, and this and that and the other. So again, I don't have any evidence on that for specifically with Dawkins. But I do know that it very much depends on who you're talking to and what you're trying to achieve. The um, um, one successful approach that a colleague of mine at Berkeley, Mike Ranney, has been using over the past couple of years is to present people with something like 400 or 500 words that explain the greenhouse gas effect. So it's, it's a succinct summary of the science of climate change. 400 words, something like that. And he has tested this in um, public settings. Like he's gone to Sea World, walked up to people, given them these 400 words to read, and then asked them a week later what their opinion was about climate change. And he can demonstrate that there's a lasting shift because he can create this aha experience in people's minds. Oh, that's what it is. And so, you know, we can be successful by explaining things to people, provided they're willing to listen. Yeah, I'm seeing it across my mind. My experience is it's with it's eight and nine year olds at the moment in, in an elementary school classroom. So, yeah, yeah. I, yes, but of that, the, the less I speak and the more, uh, the, the, the more effective that the lesson is, actually, because they will, they, they will start to turn off. And the more, and the more they do, absolutely self develop, find things out themselves. That, that's where we have most success okay. as, yeah. as, a, as a learning sort of learning. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's a general principle of mm -hmm. learning. The best way to learn is by discovering it yourself, yeah. generating it against yourself. Yeah. 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 So moving down, Fraser, the gentleman at the front, please. Thank you, Stephen. Mm -hmm. um, what's your uh, take on the connection between uh, evangelical Christianity? Mm -hmm and um, climate change denial, which is prevalent in uh, US politics at the moment. Uh, are they seeking to just simply deny science, or do they thirst after oh, Armageddon? Well, that's a very good question. I think, um, and, and I, can, I can even answer that one almost, um, because I've just done an experiment where we looked at that, and we looked at uh, whether religiosity, you know, like extent to which your religions um, predicts um, science denial. And the answer is that there is a little bit of that, as, as you said, as you, you know, suggested that um, uh, fundamentalist Christians are by and large more likely to uh, reject climate science. However, I think it's far more nuanced than that, um, because there is a stream of Christianity that is actually talking about stewardship of the earth and is very much committed to environmental protection. And in fact, one of the probably most well-known climate scientists at the moment, uh, Catherine Hayhoe, who, who is actually Canadian, even though she lives in Texas, poor thing, um, she is very outspoken. She, she is one of the most influential 100 women in the world, according to Time magazine. She's on TV all the time. She does all this stuff. She's a wonderful person and a Christian fundamentalist, um, a deeply religious person. And she's not the only one. We, we do have a lot of um, religious people um, speaking out over climate change. The Pope being a prime example last year or the year before when he wrote his uh, Laudato Si, I don't speak Latin, um, and, and where he came right out saying how important it is to look after uh, the earth. And just the other day, yesterday, the day before yesterday, there was a march of religious clergy in Bonn at the current climate conference. And it was Muslims, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, all you know, hundreds of them um, going on this march on behalf of the earth, saying, you know, we have to look after the 
after creation. So religion isn't just a one-way street on this issue. There, 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 there's a lot of nuance to this, and actually you can point to a lot of religious activism uh, about climate change. My question is related, <coughs> and that is um, when people indulge in a faith that requires the leap of faith, uh, as uh, Camus called it, um, does that make them less able to change? The leap of faith is that you make the leap this, if I am baptized in this river, I will have a new life, and I will be, and so on. And when people make that leap, I think they're shutting down part of their, their psychological uh, apparatus that would help them to <coughs> And I'm asking if you've seen that in your research. Uh, not my own research specifically, but I mean, we certainly, well, there is research on, on sort of that issue. I mean, not quite explicitly aiming at people who've, who've been baptized like that. Um, yeah, and I mean, there are some people who have less of an ability to think analytically. That's what we call it. And who show uh, instead an endorsement of pseudoscience and superstitions and so on. So yes, there, there are some some people are more susceptible to pseudoscience than others. And those who are susceptible to pseudoscience, uh, you can you can pick out are less analytic in their thinking. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely something there. Thank you. Uh, first off, thank you for coming and sharing your research and your insights with us. Um, my question is maybe a bit of a two-parter. So when I think about our kind of social landscape and social media landscape, I think of these echo chambers, these kind of self-contained universes of truth that we live in. And, and I suspect if we were to kind of ask the room, raise your hand if you have doubts about climate science, we have a room of full pockets and a very quiet room. And so my question is, what are you doing and what are other academics doing to kind of get the word out to people who may not otherwise choose to come to you know, a lecture or forum on climate skepticism? And then the second part is, what could we do when we get out there to engage with some of these people that I know I'm kind of Ignoring, I don't like engaging with a lot of people I knew in high school who are saying these things that I don't agree with. I'm not spending time with them necessarily. So, I mean, what, what, could, what should I be doing maybe to engage these people that I otherwise don't engage with? Yeah, great question. Um, gosh, and it doesn't have an easy answer. Um, let, let me first talk about the, the echo chamber situation and social media and all that. Because, yes, there, there is fairly clear evidence of this separation into different universes where you know there are people over here reading science and there are people over here reading pseudoscience one of my collaborators in italy has done some amazing work on that analyzing facebook sharings and uh, uh, posts and who talks to who and all that and then there's complete you know separation between what he calls conspiracy theorists and the scientists or the science endorsers so the polarization is real and it's a serious problem. How can we deal with that? How can, can we engage with these people? Well, I think at the moment the answer is with difficulty. Uh, you know, that, that it is very difficult to have a conversation with somebody who is, you know, believing things that I know are not true, but if I tell them that, then they say I'm part of a conspiracy to create the world government. You know, it's kind of difficult to uh, talk to people like that. So I think the solution has to be at a, at a much broader uh, context. What we really need is we have to rethink the whole social media sphere and how social media are unfolding and how they have contributed to polarization. And now that's a big ask. That's like saying, let's get rid of capitalism. You know, maybe not quite that hard, but it's, it's up there. Um, now, the last few weeks, I think, have seen quite a bit of movement 
on that issue because Facebook uh, a year ago said, oh, there's nothing to see. The Russians had nothing to do with the election. And then three months later, they said, oh, well, you know, yeah, we, we ran some ads that were paid for in rubles. And then another three months later, they said, oh, yeah, well, we found a few fake accounts. How many? Oh, well, a million. Oh, OK. Another three months later, oh, we found a few more. How many fake accounts do you have now? Oh, 60 million. Uh, and then we now know that 125 million Americans were exposed to Russian disinformation during the election campaign last year through Facebook. Now, and, and those numbers are real. I mean, that's what Facebook is now saying. And, and it's quite hilarious, if it weren't so serious, how they started out saying there's nothing to see, and now they're at 69 <coughs> accounts. Um, I think that's had an impact in Washington, in Congress, because I think everybody there is now thinking, gee, that's, you know, that's gone too far. Something has to change. And I think something will change with social media. I have no idea how and where and what the change will be, but I don't think they can get away with that too much longer. Especially now that we've discovered that some Russian plutocrat has invested in both Facebook and Twitter, which we also had <coughs> until last week or two weeks ago, to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. So, uh, and I think that's how we have to, you know, that's where we have to start. Because the technology is part of the problem. It, 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 it's what gave us Trump and Brexit and climate denial. But I also think it could be part of the solution. And there's some, let me, let me give you one example of what I'm talking about here. That there's a wonderful uh, development in a uh, news website in Norway. Um, they pioneered this, where if you want to leave a comment on one of their news articles, you can do that. But you first have to pass a quiz about the article you've read. <laughs> and, if you, and if you can't answer those multiple choice questions correctly, uh, <laughs> go back and read it again. So, you know, that's, now it's wonderful because no one is censored. It's not censorship. But what it does is it slows people down and it makes sure they actually read the thing. And by the time they've read it three times and actually passed the quiz, they've probably given up their rage or whatever it was that would made them leave an uh, intemperate comment. So, so there are ways, I think, in which we can uh, make, make a big difference to the discourse online by nifty little technological nudges. And that's where I see the solution to the problem we're talking about. How different the Brexit referendum could have been if it's sort of, yes, if it's, yes, Don't that, yes exactly. Okay. Right. Let's talk, we've had that conversation earlier. Yes, um, yes um, As you listen to this, I wonder whether there's an, an analogy here that would be useful in dealing with the gun law. It also seems to have its own ideology that it is people and not guns that kill people. And um, do you see applications, or is it a different kind of, of psychological problem in that case? Well, I uh, I haven't done research on on the gun lobby uh, or or gun guns or gun people or any anything uh, uh, to do to do with that. Although I once lived in Oklahoma a long time ago, so <laughs> <laughs> I have some hands-on experience with with these people. Um, or hands off. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it is very similar. I think um, the, the, there are clusters of attitudes. When you look at surveys about people's attitudes where they ask a multitude of questions and then, um, yeah, the whole gun ideology goes with climate denial, goes with um, possibly creationism, goes with, you know, lots, lots of other things. There, there's a whole cluster of attitudes. Um, now, I don't know what conclusion to draw from that. I, I'm quite happy to just solve climate denial. I don't think I want to get into However, what one conclusion we can draw from that, that is a very powerful lobby. It seems to be able, in the gun world, to protect or prevent the kind of legislation that you think will come down in the, the climate world. And that's kind of disturbing. Yes, I totally agree with that. And, and yes, they're an extremely powerful lobby, and they, they probably are as powerful or more powerful as the fossil fuel lobby. So, yes. And I think that's the gorilla in the room. You know, 
Everything we're talking about here tonight really is about politics sooner or later. You, you cannot do science in this arena without running into this gorilla, you know, politics. Um, and yeah, it's really about changing the political culture to, to deal with all of those problems. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. I, uh, you know, it's one thing to uh, develop in the society a consensus of belief, and certainly there are many issues surrounding that, I think. But, but equally, at some point, governments themselves, perhaps through regulation, have to move. And I think governments, including our own right here in the province, have known of this issue for many, many years. The only thing we have so far is a bit of a gas tax, a carbon tax on gasoline, and whether or not, you know, the, the market the market price of gasoline has more effect on consumption, I think, of that than the actual little tax that we pay. And I just wonder, have you seen examples in different jurisdictions of where governments have had the courage, I guess you would call it, to, uh, you know, put in place measures without losing the next election? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, first of all, the BC carbon tax is is possibly underappreciated. Um, I mean, it, it is actually quite, from what I've heard, uh, quite effective. I have colleagues here in uh, uh, British Columbia who, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm trusting them to tell me that they, something that they know well, uh, and they say that it has made a noticeable difference to uh, emissions. So it's not all, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily dismiss it. Um, but other examples of governments doing things, well, I, I, I think in, in European countries you have quite a few initiatives that are very promising. Um, Scotland is going to be, the power generation will be wholly renewable um, a couple of years ahead of schedule, and I think it was planned for 2025, and I think they're going to beat that. Now, don't cite, don't quote me on those precise numbers, I'll have to look it up what the year is, but I do know that they're ahead of uh, the game, and that hasn't done them any harm politically. Um, likewise, Denmark is making amazing progress in converting uh, their power generation to wind energy and other forms of um, uh, clean energy. And again, I don't think there was electoral cost to that. So I, I think my sense is that the politicians are very scared of suffering a political loss at the ballot box if they do something about climate change. But in actual fact, wherever you look where governments have done that, um, there hasn't been a, a political cost for that. With the possible exception, unfortunately, in Australia, where a carbon tax, actually it wasn't a tax, it was a price on carbon that was introduced by the Labour government under Julia Gillard, and then there was an election where the opposition ran explicitly on axe the tax and won and got rid of the uh, price on carbon. So, so there's that one example that is very concerning. But uh, generally around the world, I don't think it's necessarily the case that governments lose just because they impose the price on carbon or do something about climate change. So uh, earlier, you mentioned something about how people with certain political views, can you hear me? No, 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 no. not much. Oh, yeah. Earlier, you mentioned something about how people with certain political views tend to hold certain beliefs. And I was wondering whether that relationship was that of causation or that of correlation. Uh, well, very good question. Uh, I can't answer that because um, all I can observe in, in a survey is an association. So I cannot say that that is uh, causal. I would never say that. Um, yeah, that, I can't go beyond that. It's an association, it's a correlation, but I cannot uh, speak to the causation issue. Although you would think that some of these political beliefs probably preceded their attitudes towards climate change. So it's somewhat unlikely that their attitudes towards climate change are causing them to be a political conservative. So, you know, I mean, you, you can argue what the direction of causality is likely to be, but I cannot be sure. Um, you mentioned um, a number of times the United States 
uh, and the Republicans and Trump. And I'm curious if there is, if you've studied or if anyone has really studied the differences between between countries and how psychological attitudes do differ between countries, and particularly what is the difference in, in climate denial between people in Canada and people in the United States of America and in other countries in the world. Yeah, people, people have looked at that. Um, the only cross-country comparison that I've done personally is between the United States and Australia. And um, that was work done by one of my PhD students, who, John Cook, who actually is, uh, was working with Andy Scoos over many, many years, very closely. And um, what John found is that the overall pattern of the data was very similar between Australia and the United States, with one exception. And that is that if you look at the scores on this free market inventory, where we ask people their attitudes about the free market, that um, there, there, was a, there was a bump at the upper extreme end in the US that didn't show up in Australia. I mean, there were people in America, uh, um, you know, who, who were like, like full on free market fundamentalists, for like, you know, lack of a better term, uh, who didn't show up in, in Australia. And that's why I think why the whole sort of, a lot of these issues are more attenuated outside the United States because that, that relatively extreme brand of libertarianism just isn't that uh, far, you know, doesn't spread that far in other countries. And then other people have compared, um, you know, the United Kingdom, Germany, other European countries, and by and large, the, the, the countries that have most difficulty with, with climate denial um, are Australia, uh, the US, to a lesser extent the UK, uh, and then you, you go to Europe and um, Asia, and there there is hardly any any uh, denial. And unfortunately, I left out Canada because I just don't know. I, I don't have data on Canadian public opinion on that. That uh, not out of the top of my head. Um, I'm sorry, maybe you've just answered the question, perhaps you can't comment on this, but we don't really have to go and look at Australia and Denmark. We live in a province where we have a couple of very critical issues to consider right now, right at the moment. And surely at the conference in Vancouver this would have come up. We have Sightsee Dam and we have a big pipeline that's not going to bring in oil, but bitumen. <laughs> So that, we were told by our previous premier of this province, we could save the Chinese from coal. That was a great idea. That was a really interesting mental leap. Now, right here in this province, <laughs> we're, we're struggling psychologically to stand up to commentary, constant commentary about how if we shut down Sightsee, all those jobs will yeah. be lost, yeah. not talking about those are temporary jobs that will be lost anyway, one way or another. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about the pipeline, but rarely what it's going to do to the coastline. Mm. It, it's shocking what we're not talking mm. about, terrifying. Mm. So what, what did the guys say at the conference in Vancouver about that? Well, the, the conference I went to actually wasn't about climate change. It was about cognitive science generally. And, this is the and cognitive. So um, unfortunately, they they, um, they didn't say very much because probably they, they knew nothing about it, and 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 I'm in a similar position actually. I, I only heard about this dam yesterday, I think, for the first time in my life. So I'm I'm sorry, I, I don't I'm not really into the I'm not up to speed on the local issues. But I think those are I mean those issues are are faced by people all around the world. I mean whether whether it's here or Australia, it's always the same issue. And I imagine it's always the same techniques. Um, you know, people talk about jobs, uh, forgetting that actual fact. You know, by the time you work out the subsidy or whatever the government's pumping in, that each job that they're creating for a couple of years probably would have built another hospital somewhere or something, right? I mean, those are the numbers that certainly I'm familiar with from Australia, where the government is now uh, hell bent on uh, building another coal mine because they think China. Uh, doesn't want to be saved from bitumen, but wants to buy Australian coal. Uh, politicians have a way of, of phrasing this 
<laughs> as they please. Um, I don't really have any any good advice I can give you other than the fact that you know you're certainly not alone in your opposition. And my experience has been over the last five years, or however long, ten years since I started getting engaged in this, that um, every time I go somewhere, more people show up, more people are active more people are interested in doing something about this and I get a distinct sense um, of, a, of a growing dissatisfaction with the status quo and a lot of very motivated, clever people are beginning to, to want to do something about that. Now, that doesn't always translate into good outcomes, uh, Brexit, Trump, um, but I think I, um, I was at the American Geophysical Union last December, right after Trump was elected. And the governor of California, Jerry Brown, gave a fantastic speech at that conference in front of you know, thousands of climate scientists. And he said, you know, Donald Trump might have been the heart attack we had to have in order to quit smoking. <laughs> and I think, yeah, you know, that Jerry Brown is fantastic. Whatever you say about politicians, it doesn't apply to Jerry Brown. He's a really cool guy. And, and, and I think that's the way I look at Brexit and Donald Trump. It's the heart attacks that you have to have to, to quit smoking and get active with that. And certainly in the US, and less so in the UK, but definitely in the US, there's, there's an amazing um, increase in motivation and activism among uh, academics and the public at large to do something about that. But that's about the only thing I can, I can say. I don't have any local knowledge about those issues. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm wondering if you could shed a little light on one of the sort of conspiracy theory areas of climate change mitigation to do with geoengineering, because um, there seems to be a bit of a blur, a blur around that and a, bit, a lot of misunderstanding. So I'm wondering if you could bring some clarity to that issue and share some thoughts and opinions about that. Yeah, um, okay, I'm, I'm, yes, I, I, I can do that. I mean, geoengineering, the idea that we can sort of do something to the planet to undo climate change is um, not necessarily conspiracy theory. There, there are some scientists who believe that that is something we can do. Um, now, first of all, the important thing to realize is that we are engaged in geoengineering right now because climate change is a geoengineering experiment with an uncertain outcome. Um, so we're already doing that. It's, it's a little late to say, let's not geoengineer, because we've been geoengineering since we started blowing uh, carbon into the atmosphere. Now, there, there, there are huge risks with geoengineering and hugely unanswered questions. And um, also politically, geoengineering is often taken, in my opinion, is, is a camouflage or a flag that people can wave saying, hey, I'm doing something about climate change. I'm sponsoring research on geoengineering. And in so doing, they're distracting from the real solutions to the problem, which is mitigation. So I think it's important to understand why some politicians talk about geoengineering. It's because then they don't have to talk about cutting emissions. Um, would it be possible to geoengineer our way out of this? Well, maybe. However, I think the risks are immense and it's largely a distraction. With one possible exception, and that is if we found a way to remove carbon from the atmosphere um, on a large scale and bury it underground or pump it into the deep ocean where you know, really deep, or it's not going to do any harm as far as we know for the next few thousand years. Um, I mean, I think that's fine because all that is doing is to undo the fossil fuel emissions we've already had. I don't see a problem with drawing down carbon if that's all we do. But things like um, putting aer aerosols into the upper stratosphere to reflect sunlight and, and Gosh, putting, putting iron in the oceans to stimulate algae growth and all these things, that to me is, is just so fraught with risk. And uh, uh, so I, I would 
counsel against that. But does that help? Does that answer your question at least a bit? Yes. My question uh, up here, sir. Uh, I'd like to have a, a much closer look at uh, the word denial. Uh, this, this subject is climate denial, but I'd like to just set aside uh, climate to look more closely at, at denial um, in terms of cognitive uh, uh, science, cognitive behavior, psychology. Um, and of course, it crosses every spectrum of human interaction, um, not just climate. Uh, <coughs> I'm wondering if you could share with us what you what what uh, science knows about uh, uh, the whole aspect of um, the elements of denial, like um, and you know how how do how do we? I'm sure we all hold denial elements within us about things that we totally don't believe, uh, or at least think we don't, but. Um, uh, some of us may be convertible, but only if reluctantly. Uh, but so, speak about denial and possibilities of how you crack. Science has shown that it can be cracked. Yeah, that's again a very good question. So, what 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 is denial actually psychologically? Um, okay, the the I mean that's that's a big question and and. and it, could have a very big answer. So let me, let me try and condense this in, in, into something uh, manageable. To me, the um, most crucial aspect of what we call denial is that, um, first of all, people are making a claim to uh, being evidence-based. This is one of the interesting things about denial, that very often they're saying, we are the only people who have the truth. We are the only true scientists. Climate science is corrupt. We are the true scientists. So I think it's very important to understand because they're laying claim uh, to science and to evidence and to truth and all those things, which in today's world is actually a very interesting uh, claim to make. So that's the first thing to understand. Now, then the second thing to understand is that the actual cognition, the, the way people think about this, falls completely short of, of that claim. And it falls short in, in a number of ways. The, the most important one I want to pick out is that um, denial involves cherry picking of evidence. People will selectively look at evidence, use that to support their decision, uh, position, and ignore absolutely everything else. And that's the antithesis of, of the opposite of scientific thinking or scientific cognition, which means we look at all the evidence and then we balance it out and we draw conclusions on the balance of evidence. And if there's one thing that differentiates denial from science, it's that cherry picking only on a confirmative, on a confirmatory evidence. And the second thing about denial uh, the cognitive aspect of denial is that it is incoherent, unlike science. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that if, if you want to have a scientific theory or do any kind of science, then at the very least, you have to be coherent. You cannot say the Earth is flat, oh, but it's round. You can't do that. Uh, because then you're not even wrong. You know, you're not even admitted to the discussion of your scientific theory because coherence is a necessary prerequisite to um, having something that might be true. Now with denial, I actually wrote a paper on that last year, um, it turns out that that is inherently incoherent. So you might hear something like from people who deny climate change, you might hear something like, oh, it's impossible to measure global temperature accurately because thermometers don't work. Or whatever. I mean, you know, they do say that. Uh, but then in the next sentence they say, oh, and by the way, we've got nothing to worry about because it hasn't warmed in 18 years. Well, wait a minute. How do you know that? Thermometers don't work. Right? So that incoherence of saying we can't measure temperature, oh, but don't worry, it hasn't warmed. That's one of I think over 200 incoherent statements we've cataloged 
about uh, denial. And so my denial operates cognitively is that people will pick a single isolated piece of information or evidence that satisfies their needs of the moment to rebut something they've just heard. And a minute later, they'll pick something else to rebut something else, and they'll contradict themselves. And we'll be totally oblivious to that. So if I had to characterize the cognition of denial, those are the two things I will start with. There's lots more, but for now, that's starting. So um, earlier on, right here, you, you mentioned um, that if you look at a climate graph over the past thousand years or something, it would be relatively stable until today when it you know, drops out. Um, my question is regarding climate cycles and um, that, that idea. Um, do they exist? And um, if so, is there a point in teaching them? Um, yeah. Um, well, yes, first of all, let me respect what I said before. You know, we have a flat, pretty much flat stuff for a thousand years, and then this uptick known as the hockey stick, and that's for real. And do climate cycles exist? Well, yeah, absolutely. We have cycles in the climate on, on uh, pretty much any time base. Um, we have something that is due to ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which runs over a span of a couple of years that you know, superimposes fluctuations on the increase in temperature, and that's an internal variability that has something to do with ocean circulation. And then we have something known as the Milankovitch cycles, which are due to the um, uh, wobble of the Earth and asymmetry in its orbit. And the, you know, the Earth does funny things when it's sort of, it's kind of like drunk, goes around the sun, but in weird ways. And so over thousands of years, um, you get climate cycles, which in the past were responsible for ice ages. You know, I mean, and this is in fact one of the favorite arguments of deniers. Oh, the climate has always been changing. Therefore, climate change is now natural. Which is like saying, if you find a murder victim with a knife in the back on the ground, saying, ah, people have been dying of natural causes forever. <laughs> Except this guy. Um, and likewise now with climate change, you know, we've had natural fluctuation for millions of years, but it doesn't follow from that that what we're experiencing now is also natural. And it definitely is not, because it falls outside the bounds of uh, natural variability, as we have observed in the past. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this information. I, I really appreciate it. I have a, a question about the, the denial part you just alluded to, which I find really interesting. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you. Wonderful <laughs> I have a question in regards of uh, interpreting the data. I mean, maybe a simple question, but what is the biggest contributor to climate change? According to the, the data I'm reading, it's animal agriculture, and that always uh, seems to be an issue that is not being brought forward with the mainstream in general. So how could I, if that's something that I believe in, that's mostly agriculture, how, how could I figure out that that's actually the truth in regards to most people focusing on you know, the, uh, the oil and the gas industry and stuff. Well, uh, yes. Um, in actual fact, it's not most of it. it. It is a significant share of carbon emissions are due to cows doing it at both ends. Um, and so that is actually generating a lot of methane and uh, is in part responsible for climate change. And so, so are land use changes, you know, just deforestation and, and uh, you're absolutely right. Agriculture um, does play a role in this, no question. Um, but it's not all of it. It's, again, don't quote me on the numbers, but it's around 20%. So um, there, there's a lot of argument, or many people argue, that therefore we should stop eating meat because if we all became vegetarians, then it is indeed the case that there would be less bovine uh, emissions. Um, yes, that's certainly true. However, that's not the whole story. Um, the reason it's not the whole story is because there are marginal lands 
uh, in the world that are too bad for, for anybody to grow anything there. I mean, you know, it's just scrub land, there's no soil, there's no, even with fertilizing, you wouldn't get any crop out of this marginal land. However, the land is good enough to run, you know, sheep or goats or cows or whatever. Um, they can eat that stuff. People never could. And on those marginal lands, running livestock is actually, um, you know, contributing to food security and, and, and um, acceptable, even while we're trying to deal with climate change. However, it is indeed the case that we probably have to reduce our meat consumption. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Agriculture is a big issue. We have to talk about that. Thank you. Uh, you started off tonight speaking about the messaging and the 97% consensus argument was effective with people. I live at a, near the top of Mount Maxwell, somewhere between 12 and 1300 feet. And the temperature difference there to uh, down here at sea level in Ganges uh, is about three degrees. Last Saturday morning, it started to snow at my place. It had been below freezing for three or four days continuously before then. And so I got about six inches of snow. And after plowing myself out, I came down here on Monday, and there was not a hint of snow anywhere. That, to me, is a visual example of a three-degree different world. My world was frozen and white and covered with snow, and down here there was no such thing. My question relates to whether or not that three-degree or two-degree argument if you find it in your research, then that is an effective message. Do, do people respond to it? My sense, a lot of people think two degrees is inconsequential and doesn't drive anything. I have a short second question. That is, where on earth did you get those socks? <laughs> well, the second question is easy to answer because uh, I was looking forward to wearing those and crossing my legs all day. Um, <laughs> now, I bought them in Bristol from a place called T.M. Lewin on Park Road. Highly recommend them. Uh, <clears throat> now, the, the first question. <laughs> okay, I don't use, precisely for the reason you, you just said at the end, that two degrees are considered inconsequential by most people, because it doesn't sound like much. For that reason, I personally never use that, uh, any numbers of that type when I talk to uh, people because it is, it doesn't get across the real problem. And the real problem is that a two degree average increase will translate into um, far more than two degrees um, in some parts of the world, number one, like for example, the Arctic, where it's already a, a staggering eight degrees or 10 degrees sometimes, depending on when you measure it and how you measure it. I mean, it's staggering how the Arctic is warming. And so the two degrees doesn't capture that. But it also doesn't capture um, what happens when you have a heat wave. Because the two degree difference at the top end of your distribution of temperatures can, can drive you into from, from livable to an unlivable climate. Because if you live in Dubai, where a heat wave is going to you know, come that close to killing you, then you add two degrees, it actually is on the other side of that threshold where you can no longer uh, function, or at least you can no longer work. So um, that's why I think it's important to focus on the extremes when you communicate to people without mentioning specific numbers. I don't like doing that. Two degrees, and it's completely arbitrary anyway. I mean, the two degrees was a political decision, um, not a scientific decision. A lot of climate scientists would say that even one degree, which we've already had, is is not good. <laughs> Look around you. I mean, the number of extreme weather events uh, has tripled in the last thirty or forty years, and uh, you know we haven't even started yet. Yeah, I appreciated the comment you made um, in, in one of your talks. Um, with regards to the fact that the climate change conference held in Copenhagen in the cold was not a great place to start talking about global warming climate change when people actually weren't physically experiencing it. It was a chilly day. I mean, it, so you've really got to 
I mean, extreme weather events do seem to help. Um, and to experience them personally as well, to actually start getting this message across. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. That, that whoever the, the rocket scientist was who designed this Copenhagen conference in the snow was uh, not doing the world a favor. That's totally true. And there's a lot of laboratory research that shows that people are susceptible to uh, anecdotes and to experiences in the moment on the day. So on a hot day, people believe or accept climate change a lot more than on cold days. And in fact, you can even show that the proportion, <laughs> the proportion, that's <laughs> my socks going wild. <laughs> the proportion of opinion pieces in, in major North American media um, that were endorsing climate change um, are a function of the temperature in that summer. So if you have a really hot summer in Texas or whatever, you get more opinion pieces in the newspapers favoring climate action than you do in the cold year, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So even the newspapers are, their, their political opinion pieces are reflecting the temperature for that one year, which of course is weather, not climate. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're totally tuned to, to, to this. And in fact, one of my favorite experiments ever was a study where People were called into the laboratory and they were given a um, questionnaire about climate change and all that. And um, in one condition, they um, sat next to a plant and while they were doing this. And in another condition, they sat next to a dead plant. <laughs> a dead pot plant that hadn't been watered and, and it was sort of droopy and dead. And guess what? In the dead plant condition, people were more concerned about climate change. <laughs> and they had another condition in which they had three dead plants in the lab. And guess what? People were even more concerned about climate change. Now, it's ridiculous, right? <laughs> in a sense. But what it shows is that we, that, that we as a species are just very susceptible to anecdotes and, and things that are sometimes irrelevant, like colored socks. Um, and, and, you know, that is just what makes people think or take. We do that. Sorry? Yes. Um, yes. I've been interested in a lot of what you've been saying is about individuals who have these characteristics. But I'm also interested in what they link between culture and cultural and tribal connections or to all of us and how we deal with that and a society issue. It was inter interesting to me as a person who's interested in language and culture that um, all the countries you listed as being problematic are English speaking. Yes. Um, well, let me, let me start with the, with, the, with the last part about English speaking countries. I think you're wrong. And I don't think that's coincidence either. Because I think English-speaking countries, by and large, I mean, you know, on average, tend to be more committed to free market economics. Um, this whole invisible hand of the market and free enterprise and all that, those are very inherently English-speaking or English concepts. Um, Europeans have never bought into that as much. You know, you go to European democracies and they have economies that are sort of a balance, you know, they're, they're sort of more regulated and the government is much more important in running the trains and all sorts of other things. So and I think that is actually a cultural difference that, that explains why there's more denial in English-speaking countries because the more you think the free market should be free, uh, the, the more concerned you are about dealing with climate change. And as to your first question, well, I sort of answered it a little bit through that already, but um, I think that's a very uh, important question, and I don't have any good answers to that at the moment, but I just submitted a grant proposal today that <laughs> is proposing five years' worth of work to address that issue. <laughs> if we get it. But the success rate of that one is 2%, so I think... <laughs> um, oh, over here. I wanted to thank you so much for this interesting discussion. It's wonderful to hear about um, attitudes and feelings being talked about in the context of science and data. Um, and it just, it just seems to me that attitudes and feelings have as much to do with how we address issues of addressing climate change as, as the scientific data was. 
And I'm wondering whether or not the panels that hear about this, whether they be governmental or political, um, also are getting a sense of this kind of, not just the climate science, uh, but the social science and the psychological science. And the second part of my question um, is something you said earlier about, well, it doesn't really matter what people think because they're buying more solar panels and they're buying electric cars. And I, it made me wonder about what's the relationship between attitudes and beliefs and how people actually act. Because certainly, as much as someone who may not believe in climate change is buying a solar panel, um, someone who believes very much in climate change may not change their behavior yeah. or what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So what's the link? Yeah, very good question. Uh, well, the, the answer is 0. 0.5. <laughs> uh, and, and that's actually the right answer. What I mean by that is the correlation, the association between attitudes and behavior has been estimated to be about 0. 0.5. What does that mean? Well, that means that if I know your attitudes, I can explain um, what you're likely to do with the confidence of around one in four. Okay? So if there are four people here who tell me they're totally committed to climate change, then chances are one of them is going to do something. Okay, that's what that number means, roughly. I'm, I'm kind of you know, just making it intuitive. Uh, so there is that link between attitudes and behavior. Now, what I find more interesting, almost, um, is the reverse, which is that if people change their behavior, their attitudes fall suit. And I think that correlation is actually uh, often much higher. So if you get people to fasten their seatbelts, because they have to, because otherwise you get fined, then after you know, a couple of years, everybody puts on their seatbelt and they wouldn't even think about not doing that. And what we forget is how in the 1970s, when seatbelts first came out, how the opposition to seatbelts at the time was, was just amazing. People were doing the usual thing, you know, my freedom is being impinged. What's the nanny state doing trying to keep me alive? You know, this thing is going to kill me, blah, 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 all that sort of thing. You then make people do it, and within a few years, you know, no one even knows. <laughs> people are now laughing at it in retrospect that there was any opposition to seatbelts. So, um, very, very often, you change people's behavior, <laughs> and their attitudes will follow suit. And if you can do that, then, then that's wonderful. And of course, we do this all the time. You know, that's what governments are for, basically. They change our behavior. They make us wear seatbelts. They make us stop drinking and driving and all those things. And then once we've been made to do this 10 years later, we all think that drunk driving is just a travesty. Certainly, I mean, you know, most people I hang out with wouldn't even think of doing that. They would think it's just a, just a horrible thing to do. But when I was young, I mean, the attitudes were completely different on that. So I think, you know, I, I hate to sound like a sort of Stalinist or whatever, but we, we forget how effective it is to use governments to change people's behaviors, and then their attitudes will change, and no one is any less happy now wearing seatbelts than they were in the 1970s going through the windscreen every time. I wanted to ask you a question, really compare and contrast uh, climate denialism and uh, anti-vaccinationism. And I'll set it up the question in this way. When I look at Brexit or I look at climate denial, I tend to see it as a consequence of social inequality. A social what, sorry. Social inequality. And that we, that as a societies that have invested in education um, are more likely to be, uh, have less later levels of climate denial. And societies that have allowed large social stratification in the United States, Australia being two examples, um, that social stratification enables the sort of climate denial in, and so, so that's the premise, that, that's the frame I want to ask you about, uh, about anti-vaccinationism, because there's a very interesting sort of inverse social stratification with vaccination, with vaccination where you see um, in otherwise educated and literate social classes, um, high degrees of resistance to vaccination, largely coming out of Andrew Wakefield's horrific work. Um, and I wonder how, if you could compare and contrast sort of social inequality and 
education and um, within a society and the willingness to uh, resist certain kinds of things like climate science, but adopt or not adopt other things like vaccination? Yeah, that's yeah, great question. Um, I think the societal context is, is extremely important. And inequality certainly has, um, well, excessive inequality certainly has only negative consequences, as far as I know. I, I, I'm not aware of anything positive to come out looking at a society in the aggregate out of uh, excessive inequality. Um, I mean, that's very clear. The, the research on that is, is overwhelming. And one of the things that um, is often associated with growing inequality is a lower trust in, uh, in, in each other and in government and educational institutions and society at large. And trust is obviously a prerequisite for people to accept what the scientists or the doctors are telling them. So if you create an environment with low trust, then you're basically setting up a fertile ground for anybody to come along and say, yeah, don't listen to the government. You know, they're trying to create the world government. Climate change is a hoax and vaccinations are, you know, a hoax or whatever it is, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I think there is a link between inequality and lots of other things. And indirectly, I think, through trust, it's mediating uh, the occurrence of, of denial. So how do you get this inversion of, um, is it, of, so, 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 is it education level versus uh, vaccine adoption? Yeah. Okay. I. Yeah. Again, I'm. 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 Yeah. I didn't comment on that on purpose because I'm. Uh, well, I don't know if that's actually the case. Um, I have learned to be extremely skeptical of what people think about the drivers underlying vaccine hesitancy, unless they can they can pinpoint the data source for me. So uh, I'm not sure that this whole thing with education is is actually really in the data. Anecdotally, sure, it's the left, it's educated people, it's this, it's that, you know. But I don't know uh, if it shows up in the data. That's why I'm coming to that because I'm skeptical. <laughs> the last question is evening, Steve. Oh, okay. thank you. Um, thank you for being here and taking my question, or maybe two. <laughs> uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, I want to acknowledge all the youth in the room. I'm, I think this is wonderful that the subject and yourself has attracted uh, high school students and younger people. So my question is on their behalf. Um, what is the data about how the youth are feeling? And I mean, it's a huge, it's, I think it's probably a huge question, because I've been trying to think, how am I going to ask this simply? But what is the data on the youth? How are they regarding climate change? And do, does that attitude change as they grow and have to take on jobs and support families? And, yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question and slightly difficult to answer because, again, it depends on, on what country you're talking about and what survey and all that. But by and large, um, for young people, climate change is, is a far more important problem uh, when you ask them. They're far more concerned about that uh, statistically than uh, the older generation. So very clearly, young people are uh, more concerned about that, uh, quite understandably so, because they have to live with it. You know, they have to live with the mess that our generation is creating. Um, and so, so that answers your first question. Sorry, what was the second? Uh, oh, just like what will happen with the youth? It, it, oh, it's yeah. Psychologically oh, that's right. Will they will they grow out of it? Or yeah. No. Well, you know, my parents always told me when I was nineteen that by the time I was their age, I, I would think like them or whatever, and, 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 and I think they were wrong, actually, uh, sorry to say, uh, I'm still 19, uh, so, I, and, and my, I, I have a lot of respect for, for young people because I think that I don't see any uh, evidence of them, you know, letting go of, of that enthusiasm and the fire in the belly that they have to change things, and um, I think each cohort is different, even as they grow up, 
they, they do not become like their parents. There is something new there. And I'm hoping that um, young people now will carry the torch and uh, uh, force us old folks to, to clean and help clean up the mess. last question because it enables me to tell you that on January 11th, the student council at the Gulf Island Secondary School, in partnership with the Salt Spring Forum, is hosting Jeff Debicki, the 31-year-old author of the next great book on climate change, published by Bloomsbury USA, entitled, Are We Screwed? A New Generation Prepares to Fight Climate Change. 10 a.m. at GISS during the students' uh, flex block. Um, but we will be selling tickets for adults. So January 11th, 10 a.m. Tickets aren't on sale yet. Please make a note in your calendar. Um, so let me just start by saying that I I'm 100% certain that Andy Scoos would have been delighted with this evening. So thank you. And uh, thank you to, to lots of, of other people. Um, we have a new uh, partner, a small business, um, uh, Antipesto. Fed our guest this evening. So thank you. Uh, to Harvard Air um, that flew him uh, here and BC Ferries uh, that will take him away tomorrow. Uh, to Salt Spring Books for selling a lot of uh, tickets. Uh, just a note that for our next event on December 1st, which is uh, Michael Doyle, uh, former Assistant Undersecretary. General of the United Nations talking on peacekeeping and human rights, December 1st. Those tickets will not be on sale at Art Spring because the event is taking place at uh, GISS. Um, so please go to Salt Spring Books and buy your tickets there. Um, also, our media partners, The Exchange, uh, The Driftwood, um, are a uh, sponsor of our fall series, Country Grocer. Um, thank you uh, to all of the people here uh, at Art Spring, um, you did notice more youth this evening because we are increasing, um, successfully increasing the number of, of, of our uh, student volunteers. So thank you to all of them. Um, <laughs> thank you uh, to Gene Gelwix and Peter Lamb for uh, accommodating uh, Stephen and his wife Anne uh, on the weekend on, on Salt Spring. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, please, another big round of applause, uh, please, not, not, not only for our amazing speaker, but also for our amazing moderator. Um, <laughs> thank you.